Welcome to our webinar, 2024 To-Dos for Channel Incentives, our second webinar in our To-Do series. Thank you so much for being here today as we share what's trending in channel incentives in 2024. <clears throat> as I mentioned, we're doing a To-Do series, so if you missed out on the first one for meetings or would like to join our next webinar for trends and incentive travel, we'll provide you with those links uh, in the chat. And I'd like to introduce our panelists, Mike May and Kelly Coons, and have them share a little bit about themselves. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Terrace. Uh, I feel like a gentleman should lady, let a lady go first, but I see I'm on the left, so I'll go ahead and uh, keep the microphone. But I'm Mike May, president of Bright Spot. Uh, you know, the other uh, thing I would say is for many years, I was on the board of trustees of Incentive Research Foundation which is an organization I'm very proud of. Kelly serves on one of the committees, but I've mentioned that story about IRF because Brightspot sponsored IRF's 2024 trends were just released in the last few weeks. So some of the content we share is from that paper, as well as our own insights from working in the channel space, operating, I don't know, 50 or so programs for 20 or 30 different clients. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I'd highly recommend that paper to your consideration. Kelly Coons. Thank you, Mr. May. Uh, Kelly Coons. I am Director of Incentives here at Brightspot. And I've had the pleasure of being with this company and Mike May for 15 years. And even though he stole a little bit of my thunder, I'll just repeat it again. I also serve on the Content and Communications uh, Committee with the Incentive Research Foundation. Awesome. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm Tara Spricker. I'm marketing manager here at Brightspot and your host for today's webinar. Um, thank you so much, Kelly and Mike. We want to hear from you. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them by clicking on that Q&A button um, on your Zoom bar. And with that, uh, Kelly is going to kick us off with the first trend, refocus on new goals. Kelly, take Thank it away. Thank you, Terrace. Let's see, my favorite two letters on this slide are the RE at the very beginning. It's so easy as we move into a new year from, I'm sure it was a very busy year for most of us on this webinar today. It's so important to pause and refocus, not just on goals, but on new goals and to evaluate you know, the, the internal, the realities of your business internally and how those relate externally with your go-to-market strategy. You know, you probably, most of us are probably familiar with Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the one that we, we refer back to often is begin with the end in mind, which is exactly what this slide, what this trend and to do is telling us to do. In addition to just reevaluating re goals, you know, a good rule of thumb when coming up with goals is to keep them smart, simple, measurable, attainable, repeatable, and timely. You know, we, we work with a lot of our clients to make sure that their program goals, because that's you know, the, the part that Brightspot works with our clients on the most, their incentive program, you know, relate to strategic and big picture KPIs. So that's something to consider as you reevaluate and refocus on new goals. So the to do here is always start first with goals, begin with the end in mind. Ah, this one's me as well. Well, for those of us familiar with the incentive industry, move the middle will not be a new term. But for those of us who may not be quite as familiar with that phrase, move the middle means focus the majority of your efforts on the middle 60%. The bottom 20% will probably never perform. The top 20% will probably always perform, but the most potential lies in that middle. By getting them to do just a little bit more has the greatest impact on your business, more so than just the top 20% alone. That's what, the, that's what the research shows anyway. And when it comes to moving up from the bottom 60 to the top of that 60%, think about ways to make the achievement feel attainable. The steps from point A to point B should not be great leaps, but small steps to make it feel easy and repeatable. The things that we recommend in that regard are instituting something like a tier structure in your program so that even though everyone's starting from the same spot, moving up and earning at a higher rate feels repeatable and that achievement is, is amplified with those efforts. The other thing to think about, other thing to think about is, you know, once you hit the top of that 60% or you are in the top 20%, what can we do to keep them engaged and help them feel like they can still earn? 
So that's where we'd recommend an upper echelon or a top tier um, to, to be achieved or something to be unlocked. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes is one of our clients who gives away a medallion for participants who earned, hit a million dollars or joined the million dollar club and actually ran into one of those guys, one of those sales guys. And he pulled out that medallion from his pocket. He carries it with mm -hmm. him everywhere because of that achievement meant so much to him. And he's been engaged in that program for over a decade. So the to do here is add extra awards for exceeding past performance, like Mr. Million Medallion. Yeah, good. Kelly, you know, something else I know you've done with many clients is create elite elite recognition tiers, much like the airline frequent flyer programs that encourage people to move through, whether it be metals, uh, silver, gold, bronze, platinum, or gems. I think we've got one that's ruby, sapphire, emerald, diamond, something. But, one of uh, my favorites. <laughs> what's that? One of my favorites because of the jewel. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, there's one other, one other thing I mentioned on that um, when it comes to tiers. Just starting at the bottom can feel demotivating, but we have one client who recently just relaunched the program with everyone starting in the middle so that they already felt mm. like they achieved. So just something to something to think about. Yeah. I love that, especially with turnover in channels that are inherently um, high turnover. And you know, the last three to four years of the world has stirred the pot quite a bit. So um, while we all give a lot of lip service to mo moving the middle, I think that's one of the most powerful points in this whole presentation today. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this one uh, is, uh, this one's fun, rejig, which uh, rejig is actually a real word, real word. Um, at first when we were working on it, I felt like we were making up a word, but then I looked and the definition says to rearrange alter or manipulate sometimes in a slightly unscrupulous way. Well, we're definitely not adv uh, advocating that people be manipulative or unscrupulous, but I do like the word as being descriptive of a little acronym here to say, focus on your reporting, bring some business judgment, apply insights, which uh, you know, data is one thing, but digging out of the data, the insights that suggest changes is so important, and then do all that to gain market share. So as, as possible examples, if <laughs> your channel partner or uh, network has had high turnover, new rep, new rep recruitment could be a great idea. Or if there's a product line that was soft in 23, maybe you do double points in the first half of this year. And, uh, you know, so I would say that to do here is dive deep into the data and make some tweaks to the rules. Don't just do the same old thing over and over. You know, this next one I think is also very interesting. There's a consulting firm named Canalis who published a channel ecosystem report and they used an analogy of islands for all the different types of fragmented software that exist in many clients' uh, channel tech stack. You know, when you see fragmentation, the tendency is to say, well, let's let's consolidate some of those fragmented tools. Consolidation is always a great business concept. So whether whether it's uh, channel incentive management, which would be in the incentives like Brightspot does, or market development funds for co-marketing, or partner relationship management, there could be a natural tendency to do that. But our advice is to focus on the people first, because really, each of those tools on the left have pretty different audiences. CIM focuses on reps. MDF is more the channel partner company or the marketing manager at the channel partner. And PRM it feels like while the audience is channel reps, that it's really more the hosting company that wants to use it as a way to organize all of their channel literature and their partner program governance. So, you know, our to-do here would be focus first on the target audience when you think about the software. Great advice, Mike, which brings us to our next to-do or trend is that enablement is still crucial. What I like about this slide here and what the data says, it, it's not that enablement is important or critical, it is crucial. 
especially after the great resignation that we all lived through these last three, three years, as Mike mentioned, to the great reshuffle, especially in the channel space, enablement is crucial. So when it comes to enablement, what exactly is that in the space? Well, it's things like resources, training, availability of the manufacturer to enable and equip their channel to sell effectively. Not just to sell effectively, but to be well aware of the product, the product line, and how it works. What we all know about human nature is that people will do and gravitate towards what they're comfortable with. Especially when it comes to selling, we sell what we know and what we feel confident selling. So enablement becomes even more important now, more so than ever. See, the to-do here is to invest at least 10% of incentives, incentive funding, in enablement, because that return on investment will come with an X behind it. Kelly, I have a question about enablement, and I don't want to chat it to you. <laughs> Do you feel like more of your clients are doing large uh, large incentives for enablement for big certifications or micro trainings for smaller learnings with smaller incentives? I love this question. You know, I would say that we're seeing micro learnings trend uh, more, more now than ever. Um, when it comes to a large certification that might take some time as in hours or maybe even a day, that reward could be as high as $1,500 or to 2000 But those micro learnings, they're small, easy to consume, bite-sized pieces of learning that tend to stick more than a whole day's worth of learning. Mm -hmm. So they are trending. And while the, the award value might be lower, they can be stickier for that reason. Great. Very good. Very interesting from the front line. <laughs> All right. Oh, let's see this next trend. Refresh communication. Mm -hmm. A topic near and dear to my heart, but also to many of the hearts here at Bright Spot because it's something that we see get um, unfortunately undervalued, but that's the last thing that should be undervalued. When we talk about refreshing communications, that's not just the messaging, but the visual. We know that people don't read quite as much as we'd like to believe that they do, but healthy graphics, things that are fresh, that stand out, that catch the eye and the attention, help to drive the message home. So refresh the way things look, refresh the channels that you're using, consider a facelift of the website, that those communications drive back to, and then always consider multiple channels when it comes to getting the message out. What can we synergize? If it's a newsletter, what can we pair it with with our client's channel? Um, you know, this reminds me though of a expression that my dad raised me with, and that is fail or fail to plan or plan to fail. And when it comes to communications, that falls in that category because it, communications should not be an afterthought, but something that are planned out through the next six months, if not to a year, so that we're held accountable, our clients are held accountable, and our message stays strong. So the to-do oh. here is? Quit neglecting communications. Love it. Ouch. Ooh. Ouch. It's a big one. Okay. Well, this one is pretty simple because all of us that go ever go to a grocery store or a restaurant know this, that in inflation over the last three years has trended 7%, 6%, 5%. If you add those up and you compound those, it equals a 20% inflation over three years. Therefore, if you're doing the same fixed dollar incentive, your incentive is devalued over the last three years. As an example, if you were doing a $100 award for a product sale, that award is only worth $80 in today's currency. So our to-do is pretty simple here, and that is it's time to increase offers by 20% after the inflation we've experienced. Uh, let's see, so next on deck, our next trend and to-do is to consider global reward preferences. What we see here, especially in the States, when it comes to the technology vertical for, in vertical, for instance, is that prepaid cards, things like a Visa card or MasterCard tend to be the lead offer and what resonates the most. However, that does not always translate across the pond or globally due to conversion rates, deliverability, just things make that less preferable on a global scale. In the States, and, and as opposed to a prepaid card or a cash-like award, as we call it, we would recommend considering a gift card catalog, which is a catalog of closed loop vendors or single merchants like your Targets or your Williams Sonoma. That tends to be a more memorable award type rather than a prepaid card, which goes to and we see it time and time again, prepaid cards go to gas, groceries, and fast food without fail. 
that's not terribly memorable. You might appreciate it, but nothing will remind you of the, of the award that you earn, quite like a flat screen TV right in the middle of the home. Uh, let's see, so the to do here is, think audience preference, which reminds me of something else I'd want to mention. And that is how often we find our clients tending to prefer their own favorite award type or their own favorite, let's say, gift card, maybe a Nordstrom or a Lululemon. I'll call myself out there. But that's not going to resonate with our technical audience, for which so many of our programs are. So consider audience first, not you first. Ali, I remember a, uh, a program we did probably 10 years ago now that the audience looked very much like you and Terrace. It was, uh, or not the audience, our client was uh, okay. female and well-to-do, but the audience was 90% male and they wanted to do a really, really impactful contest. And they said, we want to do high-end awards like Neiman Marcus and Nordstrom and Tiffany's. And we tried to gently push back and say, well, what do you, do you think that's what the audience wants? And uh, at first they resisted, but then when they tried to talk to the field, the field told them that very thing, like, no, we want Bass Pro and a bunch of macho <laughs> awards. But yeah, that's, it's yeah. good. We do tend to think our preference there, particularly it, as you've highlighted globally, it can be very different. Mm -hmm. Very true. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Well, I believe our trend number nine, which will conclude our list today is AI. You know, AI, I feel like every study, every news report, every trend, every prediction talks about the explosion of AI. But I feel like we see very few people talking specifically about what AI can do. They just say AI will change everything. And, you know, we're seeing certain places where AI has been very impactful, like some incredible chat bots that are taking over for offshore call centers. Or I've seen it take over doing some uh, marketing prospecting or BDR prospecting. And AI is good for highly repetitive work or things that require sifting and analyzing a vast amount of data. But, you know, we also at the same time preach personalization and AI can lack personalization in marketing outreach. Um, I know I got an email once. Um, that referred to my college university. And the, the lead end sentence was something like, are you enjoying the Baylor Bears this season? And I thought, okay, this person invested some time to research. Well, then about a month later, I got another email that had a very similar lead in. I'm like, okay, I see the trick here. Somebody's AI bot is doing this. But AI does have a place. And some of the places we see that it could be helpful in channel marketing is this tremendous for idea generation, helping with brainstorming themes just to be a way to prompt ideation, as well as it could create forms, or it could be useful of creating boilerplate copy. However, whatever you generate, I feel like that gets you half the way there. You need to bring the other half of your editing, your expertise, your industry's keywords, the right messaging for your brand, the right talking points for your go-to-market, but our to-do here would be, it's time to dig into chat, deep chat GPT and don't risk becoming a dinosaur. So with that, I'll summarize our to-dos. Kelly started us off with focusing on new goals. I love that you brought in Stephen Covey, start with the end in mind. Every project should begin with what are the goals and writing those down. Moving the middle, so powerful in the channel space where there's been a lot of turnover and movement. Rejig our word for looking at reporting, judgment, insights, and gaining market shares by diving into data. Um, with the fragmented nature of channel software, yes, focus on consolidation, but primarily focus on your audience. Uh, invest 10% in enablement. We think that's so powerful this, this season in 24. Refresh communications, don't neglect them. Increase offers for inflation. Think about your audience reward preference, especially if you're global. And then we just said, dig into chat GPT. So we hope you stay on. We have time for questions. Terrace, what would you like to say about that? Um. Well, let's see. So first of all, thank you so much for your time, Mike and Kelly. Um, you gave us some great information on channel incentives. 
So um, we are at the portion for our Q and A. So if you have those questions, or if you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A in the Zoom bar. Um, while we wait for those questions to come in, I want to point out that you can find more about this topic and others with some helpful resources, such as our um, to dos for meetings, incentive, incentive travel, and sales incentives, and then our channel partner rewards guide. So those links will be provided to you in the chat um, so you don't miss out on those. Okay, let's see what came in here. Um, okay. Best award types for the channel space, domestic versus international. All right, I'll take that one. Uh, okay. Channel space, domestic. You know, I know I just said earlier that prepaid is the most or the least memorable award type, but it does tend to be very popular. Instead of prepaid or an open loop award type, we'd recommend a closed loop the gift catalog or closed loop um, merchant selection, in addition to maybe some fun larger uh, merchandise overlays for promotability and to just get some mind share. Globally, that's where merchandise is a best fit just for deliverability, reach, and tax law. Thanks. And you used the term there, Kelly, closed loop merchant cards. What would be the most popular examples of those? All right, that would be Best Buy, Target, Lowe's, Home Depot, sometimes Starbucks makes the list. Um, and then I didn't mention one because I'm starting to not qualify it as closed loop, but that would be Amazon, which is technically a closed loop card. Yeah, it, that is interesting. Yeah, we often debate internally, is Amazon closed loop or is it closer to what we would call open loop, which is a MasterCard Visa, but Think again what you said. Think about your go-to-market audience pre audience preferences, even size of awards. I think if if you're doing if you have a very widely dispersed channel doing smaller awards, and they're earning 25, 50 bucks, 75 bucks, a closed loop feels like a very classy award. If they just get a visa for 50 bucks, it feels a little bit like giving your mom a visa card for Mother's Day. It, you know, it shows more effort if you know she's a book reader and you get her a Barnes and Noble card. So true. The other curveball I throw at that, though, is Amazon being perceived as very merchandise like, especially domestically. There's no provider out there that can get on your doorstep within the same day, if not next day. So Amazon, if you're looking for a merchandise program domestically, can be a great fit. Thanks. Uh, we have another one. Aside from email, what are suggested communication strategies to reach international audience? Aside from email. Aside from email, <laughs> what are suggested communication strategies to reach international? Yeah, that, that's tough. I mean, you know, you I think if you didn't say that aside from email, email would have been 95% mm -hmm. of our answer. You know, you do see some uh, experimenting with texting. You know, I think that could you know, could be interesting. You know, the, the other would be uh, revamping the web content. I mean, you got to get them to the website. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you experiment maybe with different types of email, maybe one email is short, you know, then you do a longer, more detailed um, email. And maybe the only other one I would say is something like we're doing today, do a webinar, do an open mic call with your sales channel. And, uh, you know, particularly if it looks like you're bringing in the technical experts, mm -hmm. that can be a draw over if they just think it's the sales and marketing people. Kelly, do you have anything to add? No, the only thing I was thinking of adding is we have clients who will add a modal or a pop-up to the website since we know if email is going to get them there, how can we get more out of them or more to them once they're there, whether that's an, an interactive modal or a pop-up to help push a different message or the same message home even harder. Okay, those are good answers. Um, we have a, a time for a couple more. Um, what's a good reward dollar amount for enablement? Ooh. Hey, we're getting great questions today, Harris. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So 15 years ago when I got into this industry, the answer would have been about maybe $50. And then we saw it creep up to 75. These days it takes at least $100 just to get attention, eye share and mind share for the juice to be worth the squeeze. 
then again, I would temper that with, we want to make sure that the award value is a best fit for the award demographic. That $100 might be more than enough in, let's say the QSR, quick serve restaurant space, but in the enterprise software sales space, it could take more than that, if not at a minimum $100. Yeah, I think the key you said earlier was think about the time investment. I know we had a client that they challenged their reps to gain technical certifications and it could take four hours or eight hours or 12 hours. And those had large awards, but on the complete other extreme, we have some new clients that are in the kitchen and bath fixtures where they're selling smaller dollar products, but they're doing a lot of micro learning where if they complete a micro learning, they may get $5 worth of points into their account. So no perfect answer, but match it to the time requirement. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more. Um, my program feels stale. How do you keep your program fresh? Uh, Terrence, that's easy. You just need to call Brightspot. <laughs> Kelly, I love that. Kelly's team can help you keep it fresh. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously I'm, I'm being facetious, but I'm not. You know, I think... In, a, a subcontracted channel management partner for your incentives. You, you know, here we put together timelines and we're held accountable to those timelines. And you can hold your partner accountable to those timelines to make sure they're introducing ideas to keep it fresh. Uh, if it's internal, you can excuse yourself and say, well, I'm going to do it next month. I'm going to do it next month. But here we do program reviews with our our clients, we do what we said, we dive deep into the data. And, you know, we ask, you know, we ask them, what trends do you see? We think we see this. Does that suggest actions we need to take to keep it fresh? But certainly we've we've harped on communications a lot. I think we're harping on it because that's the number one most neglected area we see in channel programs. And those channel programs end up being the best kept secret due to insufficient communications. Kelly pointed out another great way to keep it fresh is do some enablement, whether that's a new product, if the product you're strengthening, if it's a new vertical that you're focused on, do some training and learning and enablement rewards around that. And then also just even mix up your contest. I don't think this whole time today we said the word overlays, but at times we will do overlay contests that could run for one quarter or two quarters that Besides the base awards, reward a bigger, big award, like a trip to the Super Bowl or the World Cup or mm -hmm. trip to the beach or a flat screen TV, something that it, it's really more about drawing people in. It's the equivalent of the promotion on the end of the aisle cap at the grocery store that you walk by. And, Whoa, what are they doing here? You know, it's trying to get you to look at the bag of Doritos chips and see if you, you want those. So a lot of ideas from communications to enablement to overlays. Love it. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for being our panelists. It was a great webinar today. Um, that concludes it. Thank you guys so much.